distressed or if you need help, please advise the clerk. I would like to now welcome our panel of witnesses, uh, appearing as an individual, Nicole, uh, Dr. Nicole Fairbrother, Clinical Associate Professor, Department of Family Practice at the University of British Columbia. Uh, on behalf of the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, Dr. Lisa Galia, Senior Scientist and Treleving Chair, Women's Mental Health, representing the Kawartha Sexual Assault Center, Jocelyn Enright, Coordinator, Community Engagement, Communications and Fundraising. And on behalf of Persons Against Non-State Torture, Linda McDonald, co-founder, and Jean Sarson, co-founder. Uh, welcome to all of our witnesses. You'll have five minutes for your opening statements. We're going to begin with Dr. Fairbrother. Uh, you have the floor. And do I press? Do I need to press anything to begin? No. Okay. Good morning. Did Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I'm aware from colleagues of mine that uh, women's mental health encompasses a broad range of conditions that others have already spoken about this week. So in my five minutes, I'm going to focus on my own areas of knowledge and expertise. I'm going to discuss with you two key topics in this area, postpartum thoughts of infant-related harm and their relationship with infant safety and mental health, and perinatal anxiety and anxiety-related conditions. To begin, unwanted and intrusive thoughts of one's infant being harmed by accident are reported by 99% of new parents, with over half of new parents reporting unwanted intrusive thoughts of harming their infant on purpose. This is not generally known, and understanding of this phenomenon is limited. This lack of knowledge has significant negative consequences for parents and for their infants. We now have superb data showing that when unwanted and intrusive, thoughts of harming one's infant on purpose are not associated with an increased risk of violence towards the infant. They are, however, associated with significant distress and an increased risk for mental health difficulties, the most common of which are obsessive compulsive disorder and depression. Healthcare providers are understandably concerned when a parent discloses thoughts of harming their infant. However, a lack of knowledge in this area often results in unnecessary referrals to child protective services, monitoring for child abuse, and on occasion child removal. These actions, when there is a real risk to infant safety, are necessary. However, when not necessary, these dramatic actions can have devastating consequences for parents and for their infants. In this area, I would recommend that we develop and evaluate education for care providers to improve their knowledge and management of these disclosures of harm thoughts, that we would seek to understand and mitigate the negative consequences of disclosures of postpartum harm thoughts by parents to care providers, and in particular for Indigenous parents, assess the effectiveness of education regarding postpartum harm thoughts in reducing the mental health consequences of them, and to learn more about the experience of postpartum harm thoughts by fathers and parents of other genders. With respect to the anxiety and anxiety-related disorder, there are more than 10 such conditions. They disproportionately affect women, and as a group are the most prevalent of all mental health conditions. They are also associated with significant distress, life impairment, and increased health care costs. For convenience, I will refer to the anxiety and their related conditions collectively as anxiety disorders. 21% or 1 in 5 pregnant and postpartum people suffer from one or more of these disorders. They are of particular importance during the perinatal period because they also negatively impact infant and fetal development. For our healthcare system to respond effectively to people suffering from these conditions, we require accurate and effective screening, assessment, and treatment. Outside of reproduction, we have excellent psychosocial and medication treatments. Talk therapy, in particular cognitive behavior therapy, or CBT, is the treatment of choice for many of these conditions. CBT is typically as effective as medication at the conclusion of tre treatment and superior at follow-up or at preventing relapse. However, publicly funded CBT is extremely limited. Consequently, frequently, only those with third-party medical coverage or the means to pay high out-of-pocket costs are able to access treatment. Among perinatal people, there is a high acceptability of screening, and talk therapy is strongly preferred to medication. 
Pregnant people are especially in need of access to evidence-based talk therapy for their mental health concerns because of concerns about the potential negative impact of psychotropic medications on the developing fetus. My recommendations in this area are to increase research to identify accurate and reliable screening tools for perinatal anxiety disorders, assess the impact of mental health screening on mental health outcomes for both perinatal depression and anxiety, assess the effectiveness of CBT in perinatal populations, and identify low-cost ways of increasing CBT access for perinatal people in particular. And generally, I think increased funding specific to perinatal mental health would be very beneficial. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you, Dr. Fairbrother. Uh, next, from the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, Dr. Lisa Galia. Welcome to the committee. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair and honorable members. I've been a professor for over 25 years, first at the University of British Columbia and now at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and the University of Toronto. I'm also scientific lead of a Women Mind, which is at CAMH, uh, Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and also the lead of the Women's Health Research Cluster, which has over 570 members across 29 countries worldwide. Uh, both of these initiatives have common goals, dedicated to, in part, closing the gender gap in science by putting the unique needs and experiences of girls and women at the forefront of mental health research. As a neuroendocrinologist, my research is on how estrogens and stress influence female mental health across a lifespan from a biological perspective. My driving questions have been around why women are more likely to be diagnosed with depression and Alzheimer's disease compared to men. What is it about our brains that make us more um, uh, susceptible to these disorders? Indeed, we and others have found numerous molecular signatures in the brain that differ by sex and female-specific experiences and underscore the vital importance of continuing this work because one size does not fit all when it comes to mental health interventions. By understanding, but beyond understanding sex influence on disease, I have been studying how female specific experiences such as pregnancy, menopause, <clears throat> and hormonal contraceptives influence the brain. The time of greatest risk for first time depression is in the postpartum and in perimenopause. However, these female-specific experiences are rarely considered in the literature. How rare? We found that only 3% of neuroscience and psychiatry studies have examined women's health questions. Indeed, there are nine times more studies in males compared to females. I'm actually a highly cited scientist, top 2% in the world. I have over 200 publications, but it has been very challenging to get the research to do work in this area. And my experience is not unique. Um, as many of, the co of us have comments on our grants that say add men or add males. And this is for grants that center on pregnancy, placenta, and um, uh, female specific cancers. We need women's health research, as without the research, we can't tell our healthcare providers where to steer the boat, as our research discoveries are our compass and our map. Yet, Although attention to the lack of equity in health research is improving, most of it is directed towards sex and gender differences in disease and health. But we need to understand specific research on women's health and female-specific variables across the lifespan is crucial for improved mental health outcomes. Women's health research has been undervalued, understudied, and underfunded. Not only do females and women have a unique physiology and experiences that impact their health differently than men, Many women experience them differently at different times in their lives than men. And ignoring these differences, it becomes more difficult to accurately diagnose and treat these conditions. Another large study found that for over 980 different disorders, women were diagnosed 3.7 years later than men were for the very same disease. This was true for mental health disorders, this was true for Alzheimer's disease, and more. A fundamental reason for these disparities is that most of our medical knowledge, including our diagnosis criteria, are based on data in men and experiences in men. This has led to the labeling of the symptoms in women as atypical. <laughs> this atypical label is seen across a wide variety of disorders, including depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, autism. It's only atypical when you compare it to men. It's not atypical for the 50%, roughly 50% of our population. And words matter. This atypical label likely contributes to the delay in diagnosis. And an earlier diagnosis, we know, leads to earlier interventions and improved outcomes. Another study we did, we examined over 8,000 Canadian grants across 11 years. 
and we found that less than 6% of federal funding went towards women's health research. A recent World Economic Forum report suggests that we could save $1 trillion a year worldwide if we invest in women's health research. The U.S. government is promising $12 billion for women's health research. When funding for specific issues is protected, amazing discoveries are made. Just consider the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge 10 years ago. That raised $115 million for ALS, and this investment has more than doubled the number of researchers, publications, and in increased the number of clinical trials 10 times, such that now we have at least four new approved treatments. I recommend a concerted national investment in women's health research as this is necessary for improving uh, women's mental health outcomes. Only when society values women's health factors and pays more attention will we um, be able to realize the promise of precision medicine. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Galia. Next, from the Kawartha Sexual Assault Center, Jocelyn Enright. Uh, welcome to the committee. You have the floor. Thank you. Uh, it's an honor to present today to this standing committee speaking on the health of women and girls. My name is Jocelyn, my pronouns are she, her, and I work at a small sexual assault center in Peterborough, Ontario, who receive around $340,000 in core funding from the provincial government under the Ministry of Children, Community, and Social Services. I will share that our center does support survivors of any gender, however, I am going to focus on our supports for women and girls today. I would like to highlight the significant impact sexual violence has on the health of women and girls, including trans women and all other women members of the 2S LGBTQIA community. I will discuss the need to mitigate long-term mental health concerns for survivors, the need for more preventative measures, and the need for more core funding to accomplish these goals. Women survivors of sexual assault are more than twice as likely as male survivors to develop post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, with symptoms lasting up to four times longer than males, even when controlling for the extent of trauma exposure and the type of sexual assault experienced. According to the DSM-5, some of the highest rates of PTSD are found among rape survivors, with rates ranging from one-third to over one-half. Symptoms include re-experiencing the traumatic event through flashbacks and nightmares, avoiding reminders of the traumatic event, startling easily and experiencing negative thoughts and beliefs that impact daily living. PTSD is commonly associated with many other health and mental health disorders and is not the only mental health condition that may develop after sexual assault. Survivors may also develop generalized anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, suicidal ideation, self-harm behaviors, chronic pain and chronic health conditions, eating disorders and body dysmorphia, obsessive compulsive disorder, and dependence on substances as a means of coping. Many women may also receive diagnoses of personality disorders, like borderline personality disorder, after experiencing trauma, disorders that carry heavy stigma and may lead many programs to deem their cases too complex. Researchers suggest that there is an overdiagnosis of personality disorders in women who have been sexually assaulted, particularly, and advocate for diagnoses of complex PTSD instead. The risk for these related mental health conditions may be greater for individuals who experience sexual assault at a younger age. Early trauma can cause disruptions of neurotransmitters and negatively impact brain development. Trauma changes the connections and wirings in the brain and may influence our ability to process and regulate emotions later on, symptoms often associated with said personality disorders. Complex PTSD is often seen in women who have experienced multiple sexual traumas or experienced sexual trauma early in childhood. Girls who experience childhood sexual abuse, or CSA, are at an increased risk of being sexually assaulted in adolescence and as adults, further increasing their risk of developing further mental health disorders. It is important to note that unfortunately, our center are not funded to serve clients under age 16. This leaves a significant gap in services for girls. Where do we send them if they don't have money for private therapy, or we don't have other agencies in our area that specialize in supporting sexual assault survivors? We have many folks come through our doors as adults who are looking for support for their experiences of childhood sexual assault specifically. Imagine how much more we could do for these survivors if they could access our services and supports immediately after experiencing childhood sexual assault. Imagine the ease that that would have on all health resources down the line if we could mitigate that trauma rewiring before it becomes ingrained, mitigate the development of all of those other mental health disorders. 
Imagine if we treated complex PTSD in women and girls instead of labeling them with stigma later in life. Our agency services four large counties around Peterborough, and 2021 census data estimates around 336,864 residents are in our catchment area. Even just looking at women and girls alone, that's a lot of people, and I'll note that our core funding supports pay for one management role, one admin role, one prevention educator, and one counselor. Women who are believed and not blamed and offered trauma-informed support after a sexual assault are less likely to develop these long-term mental health impacts. The sexual assault centers across Ontario and Canada are extremely underfunded. If more core funding was invested into these agencies, survivors of sexual violence would get better access to supports in a timely manner, which would prevent many instances of these long-term disorders. Prevention education also needs to be prioritized. In Ontario, a lot of sexual assault centers cannot take on this role for lack of capacity and funding or take this role on with limited funding. If we can teach young boys early about the core foundations of sexual violence, consent, masculinity, and the patriarchy, we will see rates of sexual violence decrease over time. Right now, our funding provides us with the bare minimum to provide Band-Aid solutions to women, often long after the harm has taken place and neglects the power of prevention in creating lasting change. We work tirelessly to make the world as safe a place as possible for women and girls, but the reality is we are dramatically underfunded to do so. Providing additional core funding to sexual assault centers will have a great impact on the future for women and girls and their health and mental health. The federal government can play a role in this by advocating to the provincial government for additional funding and can look to federally funded programs like public safety and gender-based violence to help support that core funding. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Enright. Uh, next, uh, Persons Against Non-State Torture, uh, Ms. McDonald and Ms. Sarson. I presume you're going to divide your time. I'll leave that up to you, but uh, the next five minutes is all yours. Welcome. Mic on yet? Yes. Okay. I'm Linda McDonald, and this is Jean Sarson, and we are Persons Against Non-State Torture and are members of the National Council of Women of Canada. We are retired public health nurses, grassroots feminist activists, and for 31 years have supported women in Canada who have been subjected to torture by non-state actors or non-state torture, starting with one woman in our community from Nova Scotia. We proudly bring these women's voices, many having endured non-state torture from infancy onward, and they all have endured grave discrimination. Non-state torture is torture that occurs in the domestic or private sphere, in relationships perpetrated within families, in human trafficking, in prostitution, in pornographic exploitation, in violent groups and gangs, dismissed as social, cultural, traditional, or religious acts or norms, and can be committed through migration, displacement, and humanitarian unrest. Non-state actors defined by the UN Security Council are any individual or entity not acting under the lawful authority of the state. Acts of non-state torture are intentional and can include mental or physical severe pain and suffering with electric shocking, water torture, forced drugging, group or gang raping, beatings, whippings, cutting, burning, forced impregnation, and abortions. Because Canada's criminal code lacks a law against non-state torture, the women are invisibilized, pathologized, and mislabeled mentally ill. Their normal responses to non-state torture are seen as a disorder, and discrimination prevents them from receiving the proper mental health care they need to heal with dignity from such serious crimes and human yeah. rights violations. A simple example is Sarah, a survivor of non-state torture getting blood work at our local hospital. Seeing blood tubes in the elevator, she got triggered and fell to the floor. The hospital staff misunderstood her response, placed her on a stretcher with raised side rails, and watched by a uniformed commissioner stopped her from escaping. After eight hours, she called us in the hospital and we helped settle her. If the staff had understood this is a normal response to the torture, terror of seeing her own blood. This eight-hour ordeal could have been prevented. Using our own victimization, traumatization-informed model of care, we have been successful in helping women heal from non-state torture. Uh, <clears throat> I will continue. 
and I will offer evidence-based and victim-centered research. We are not alone in identifying and understanding the mental health differences between non-state torture and assault or abuse victimizations. Our research questionnaire asked citizens whether 48 violent behaviors were indicative of assault, abuse, or non-state torture, if many or all were inflicted on one person. Of 776 respondents, 723, 93% were Canadian. 680, 88% were female respondents. 89, 12% were male, seven unanswered or said other. 7% were from other countries. 8% came via the, our website or regular mail. This questionnaire also asked, if you were forced to choose between being a victim of abuse, assault, or non-state torture, which would you choose? 680, 88% chose assault or abuse. Explaining non-state tortured was more life-threatening, more dehumanizing, more painful, more difficult to heal from, and being disbelieved. 6% were undecided or did not answer. 6% chose non-state torture, as two women explained that's all they knew. One woman said, I was brought into a child sex trafficking ring by my father when I was around the age of four. Most of what I was put through in this ring I consider to be torture. I am still having powerful flashbacks, which include body memories to this torture. And the other woman said, I was definitely tortured. I use this term to help health care professionals and others understand my childhood and not minimize it. Our three recommendations are to criminalize torture perpetrated by non-state actors as a torture crime, to recognize non-state torture, victimization, traumatization, informed care, and Education on violence against women must include non-state torture victimization. Women cannot mentally heal when social political injustice dehumanizes them as persons with no legal right to truth tell, not treated with dignity, disbelieved, and not protected from non-state tortures. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We're now going to begin with rounds of questions, starting with the Conservatives. Ms. Roberts, please, for six minutes. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all the witnesses. I commend you. Your work is so important, and I, I, I applaud you. So I'm going to start with uh, Linda and Jean. And I have to tell you, if you haven't read their book, don't read it at night before you go to bed. Um, so I'm going to quote a few things because I want to get to the torture part because I think women, um, this non-state and state torture is not fair. So I'm going to start by a quote on page 15 of your book from Sarah. No hope for people like me. Page 27 quote from Sarah. Father was using her for his friends and her aunt was making her sleep with her son and making them do things while well, she watched, and that dogs were used. Page 33, quote, in 2020, in 1993, the world did not acknowledge such dehumanization brutally as non-state torture, as a form of violence being inflicted on girls and women within family relationships. Sarah feared she would self-harm herself if she could not get out, and she kept repeating, get out, get out, get out, which meant all crimes perpetrated against her. She said, I know they didn't want me to die because I was their commodity. I could go on and on. There's many, many quotes that really touched me when I read through a lot of the um, information in her book, in your book. And one of the things that really shocked me was when she said, big people, adults, Ministers, government workers, cops, pilots. Basement orgies are like other people having parties 
or Tupperware, etc., and being taken way back in woods and tortured and raped continuously. So my question to you is, the study we're conducting today on women's mental health, so let me ask you this. If a woman has suffered horrible atrocities from the hands of a family member, a spouse, or stranger, and the Canadian legal system does not acknowledge that she has been put through is torture, what would, you, what would that do to women's mental health? For example, gang rape has been acknowledged by the United Nations as torture, but the Canadian criminal, criminal code does not. So what happens to the women's mental health who has finally had the courage to step up and name her torturer and have the legal system say, no, you didn't experience torture? I'll, I'll leave it to one, Linda or Jean to answer, please. What happens to them? Well, Linda and I, in 1993, when Sarah came to us, we had no idea that in families uh, torture happened. So what we learned is that they survived by disassociation. Sarah did not know she was a human being. She did not know. When we said to her, Sarah, you're a human being, she said, nobody ever told me that. She thought she was an it, an IT. That's how she... Uh, explained herself as a human being. I was an it. And some women, um, and Sarah included, often when she was trying to heal, she would want to hold her hand because she said she could not feel any sensation. Because in order to survive, they have to cut off their senses. They cut off their smell, they cut off their sense, physical sense, they uh, cut off their visual sense. I was sitting outdoors with Sarah one day in the fall, and all of a sudden she said, look, look at the trees. They're turning color. She said that she had only seen in black and white. And we see that over and over again. And when you reference the issue to get out, get out, it was the fact that the torture memories were so heavy, and if they're not listened to, they don't know what else to do. So as other people have said here, they start cutting, they're self-drugging, they have difficulty with the food they eat, and they also go into, uh, for Sarah, she was also taught by her parents to, um, if you will, die by suicide. When she was a little girl, they used to put her, this is her telling, in the hallway and teach her how to cut her wrist if she ever told. So when we met her, she was almost 30 years old. She was a professional, she had a professional job, and she was still living two lives. And people seem to not understand that. Yet we know that in domestic violence, women go to work, they go to work, they go home and get beaten. She was a professional, she went to work, she went home, even almost at 30, was still being tortured, was still being trafficked, and still did not understand that what she was living was uh, violence. And what we have to understand, it takes time for them to understand what they've been going through, because survival, she was a, a baby, and the torture started then. So I just want to say one thing, because I know I don't have a lot of time. So there was a quote on page 43, I have lived my life doing what others wanted me to do with the hope they might love me or come to care for me even a little. So I want to thank you, Jean and Linda, for saving her because reading this book has taught me a lot. And I think that the non-state uh, non torture and torture, it really, it, it's, it's very similar. How can, how can a country like Canada not look at this as torture? This woman that you were able to save today, that was torture. That, that, so go ahead, Linda, yeah. sorry. And what I wanted to do is, uh, is explain how Sarah and all the women feel because there's no law in our country. Right. It's one thing to be dehumanized by your family or traffickers or in prostitution or in pornography, but it's another to be dehumanized by your country. Because they are, they are told by their country that all Sarah endured 20,000 rapes by the age of 20. So if we want to call that assault in our country, that is an injustice, a grave injustice to her. It's, it reinforces that she's an it and that nobody will ever believe her. 
And you know, how do we know, how do we say that women in conflict that are gang raped, they were tortured, but yet in our own country, Sarah, who was gang raped, or women after a hockey game were gang raped? How do we say to them that it's, a, it's assault, it's not, it's not torture? So that's the injustice that we're telling them, that they don't, they're not as important. And um, it's a form of discrimination that they live with every day. Thank you. That's your time. Uh, Ms. Sidhu, please, for six minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, all the witnesses. The work you are doing for all women, heads off to you, and uh, keep up the good work. But thank you for your insightful testimony. Um, my question is to Dr. Glia. Dr. Glia, you talked about in your testimony, um, you know, the women are behind nine times more study on men than women. What barriers you are seeing and what, uh, you know, the federal committee, uh, the recommendation you can provide us today, how we can help in, the, in, the, in this matter? Uh, so I think uh, my personal opinion, my recommendation is to have protected ring fence funding for women's health in general um, uh, and for the research because when you protect the funding for research in a specific area, researchers, uh, multidisciplinary researchers will write the grants and do the research in that particular area. If we leave it open to saying, uh, right now the federal grants, um, there's a lot of uh, um, attention paid to sex and gender-based analysis, which is fantastic and laudatory, and they'll tell you that 90% of their grants are doing this, but they've analyzed a mandatory box that um, we all have to fill out. And we, we actually analyzed what they said they were going to do, and that's when we found that only, I think it's if you exclude female uh, breast cancer, it's 4.4% of federal grants are going towards women's health questions. So it, I can't tell you all of it, I, I can just tell you my experience that it is very undervalued. Uh, part of the reason I wanted to start the Women's Health Cluster was to empower researchers to do this kind of work. Um, I have heard from women's health researchers that they don't want to call themselves women's health researchers because they feel it's undervalued. Um, and as I said, I get questions even, um, one of the things we do is postpartum depression in my lab. And I've been told multiple times trying to publish it or trying to get grants that this is an important research, even though we know that it's a, you know the time of greatest risk to develop depression in a person's lifetime. So I think ring fence funding. So right, ALS, Ice Bucket Challenge, AIDS is another really HIV AIDS. Lots of money the Canadian government gave worldwide. Lots of and it went from a death sentence to people now being able to live with the um, infection. So I. That's, that's the solution to me. That's our compass and map. One other point I want to mention, you said that 3.7 years later diagnosed yeah. the same. So this is something, uh, again, on the lack of data, lack of the research funding, or just what are the, it's a different diagnose, diagnosis? What is the? I think that's a really fantastic question. Um, I think it's all of those things. There are going to be um, things on the biological side of things. There are going to be things on the social side of things as well. So um, we talk about the U's and the D's, so the denial, dismissal, delay, and diagnosis, understudied, undervalued, underfunded. Um, a number of, uh, of diseases and disorders do manifest differently, right? That's where we get that atypical label from. And a, a big one, there was a, a story just recently about a woman in her 40s having a heart attack and they didn't recognize the symptoms because one of the major symptoms is they don't feel well, right? And you've probably seen those stories. They go to the ER and they get prescribed antidepressants. So I think that's, that's a big part of it that um, we don't recognize that the symptoms can be quite different. Uh, and that likely means that the manifestation brain-wise, uh, body-wise, is also quite different, so requires different kinds of treatments. Uh, but it's just not, it's not, it's unfortunate. Like, we also looked in, of those 3,000 studies, we looked to see, did they analyze by sex or gender? First of all, very little work on gender in general um, in the journals we looked at, and it was 3% of studies, 3%. Uh, thank you. And uh, we heard that uh, the way perinatal cl classes are structured right now, mental health is often overlooked or not talked about. Um, can you uh, tell us how the training for future parents could be improved? Uh, you can talk about Dr. Glia or if, uh, you know, Dr. Fair, uh, brother, you can talk about that. 
Any, anyone can comment on that. Yeah, could you just clarify your question, please? So um, the perinatal classes, um, yes. how it's structured right now, uh, mental health is often uh, overlooked or not talked about in perinatal classes. Um, how the training our future parents could be improved these classes or anything missing from these classes? So you can talk about that. You go. You you want want go? Yeah, I do want you to go uh, first. I can finish up, but I think you probably know. I, know a little more about prenatal no, classes no. than I, I do. Don't know, I don't know about the prenatal classes, but I can tell you that, because um, I did this little analysis very recently, but I, we looked at books that are written, and I'm sure you've heard this, I think you might have heard this on Monday as well, that so much attention is paid to the pregnant person. Uh, once the baby's out, all the attention moves to baby. Very, very little attention goes on the birthing parent. And that, that's a problem. Uh, another problem is mental health is still such a stigma in our country. But one in two of us will experience mental health issues in our lifetime. One in two. So that means that either us or someone we love dearly is going to go through that. So I, I just, I never understand this stigma. So we have to break up with a conversation. We have to make it clear that it's okay to talk about uh, mental illness. I, you know, obviously there's um, repercussions for talking about it when you're pregnant, but uh, it's a very susceptible time. And, and there are a lot of biological signatures during the postpartum period that match what happens during pregnancy. So it makes sense that this would be a very particularly vulnerable time. Um, yeah, and I, I would say certainly one of the things that we notice within the area of perinatal health is that there, there is so much focus on the infant, which obviously is terribly important, but the, the focus on the infant sometimes comes across in such a way that women, the birthing parent, is, is no more than a vehicle to producing a healthy child. That the woman herself is not perceived as having authentic and independent needs other, separate from the needs of the child. And I think mental health is a really great example of that because we're so focused on infant development. So for example, it would be very difficult, I think, to get a lot of attention for mental health difficulties in the birthing parent, the mother, if there were no implications for fetal development because there's such an orientation around the infant. And when you talk about prenatal education around mental health, one of the, the place where, for me personally, because this is my area of work, when we talk about postpartum harm thoughts, most parents, most pregnant people have no idea that this can happen to them. And part of the reason for that is once it does, they're terrified to tell anyone in case somebody reacts in such a way as to take their child away, they think they're demonic. And we've had people come to me in the lab saying, um, I tried to give my baby up for adoption because I was so afraid of these thoughts, or um, I became suicidal because I was afraid of these thoughts. Had they received education prenatally around these mental health concerns, even tip sheets, fact sheets, would make a difference to what them going into this experience and Thank kind you. of knowing what's coming. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Fairbrother. Uh, sweet Madame Laroche for six minutes of play. Now, Ms. Laroche, for six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Chair. I don't know where to start. This 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 morning, I had the feeling that I felt this deep inside. Uh, what you said in your testimony, uh, Ms. McDonald, Ms. Gallia, Ms. Uh, Fairbrother, uh, thank you very much. It is true that there is a lot of stigmatization, and we've all heard uh, stories from our families. I've lived with people with mental health issues, with depression, uh, who at some point in time I'm sorry, Ms. LaRouche, I hate to interrupt you, but we are lacking interpretation on Zoom. Uh, we are going to freeze your time and then try to fix the technical issue. They're also struggling to figure out the translation. Oh, it's Leah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> when I'm in the chair, I can't take out her. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Yeah. 
I'm so sorry, Oh, it's okay. No problem. <laughs> Mais moi, j'avais pas de problème de mon côté. Là, je de... I, th I think it, I think it was implied, but I'll do it formally. We're going to suspend until we can resolve the problems with uh, translation. So the meeting is stand suspended.
Meeting back to order, I understand our technical problems have uh, resolved, so thanks again to the, uh, to the IT professionals for making that happen. Uh, Madame Laroche, uh, merci de votre patience. Ms. Laroche, thank you for your patience. You still have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, as I was saying, uh, it's one out of uh, every two people that will have some kind of mental difficulty in life. And if people are not directly affected, they surely know someone in their families. And um, unfortunately, I've had um, suicide in my own family. And um, as a mother of a two-year-old girl, I am very worried for her. And there are organizations in my region as well that, uh, that have done some work. Oasis uh, Mental Health, they are doing excellent work with families. And every year I go to their uh, benefit brunch, which, will, which is also around the corner. And there's also the 40th anniversary of the uh, Suicide Prevention Center uh, in my region. So as a permanent member of uh, the FIVO uh, Women's Condition Committee, since my arrival on Parliament Hill in 2019, I've uh, had, uh, of course, many opportunities to work on these issues, the 30th anniversary of the polytechnic and then misogynistic uh, assaults and attacks against women. Now, in the Women's Condition Committee, we keep seeing time and again how p women are impacted disproportionately, and I have a hard time understanding this. I don't know who to start with, um, but maybe Ms. Fairbrother. You talked about uh, indigenous women as well. And right now at this other committee, we have an ongoing study on red alerts. And you referred to differences with mental health when it comes to indigenous parents and families. I'm sorry, I will be responding uh, to your question in English. I think I, I cannot speak across all of the various mental health conditions that may affect pregnant and postpartum people, but, and, I, and also to acknowledge with, you know, deep humility that as a white colonial settler person that I, I, I have to tread carefully in this area as I, I can't speak with authority in some, in some ways. However, I think that when we talk about phenomena such as postpartum harm thoughts, which is a core area of my research. Um, if I were an indigenous parent in Canada, I cannot imagine ever disclosing that to anyone. And we know from talking to white mothers that this is a hard thing to talk about. There's a lot of secrecy around it. And I can only imagine that as an Indigenous parent with our history of child removals in Canada, specific to Indigenous parents, that this would be near impossible. And so what that means is that if one's having that kind of experience, there will be hesitation to talk about it. And I do think that hesitation to disclose mental health difficulties very likely encompasses a broad range of mental health problems because of fear of consequences and authority figures and the healthcare system in general. And so recently I had an email from someone who reached out to me because they had been experiencing thoughts of harm related to their infant. And um, she shared with me that at the hospital there was quite a warm and cordial response. Initially there was some discussion and her family physician had sent her to emergency because she'd been told this was the quickest way for her to then get sent to reproductive mental health. Once she disclosed that she was of an indigenous ancestry, and keep in mind she puts blonde highlights in her hair just like her mom so that people don't immediately know that she's indigenous because it makes her feel safer, just for context. So just how much thinking goes into who you are as a person. And so once she had disclosed her indigenous ancestry, she said immediately reactions changed. She was left alone in a room for a period of time. The consequence of this was that she didn't have any contact with mental health services. She was referred to Child Protective Services, 
her whole family had to move for a period of two to three months so that they could be monitored for potential child abuse because they couldn't provide that monitoring in her own city. And, you know, I am now in contact with various health authorities and working to, to provide some education and training around this because this was so traumatic for this person. So, so I think that while specific to harm thoughts, that's a really big area of non-disclosure, there are similar things happening in, in, across other mental health conditions. Thank you, Ms. LaRouche. Uh, you used up all of your time. Please, for six minutes. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, my first uh, question is for Dr. Fairbrother. Uh, you spoke about um, apprehension uh, of uh, children resulting in um, greater levels of potentially greater levels of depression uh, with, with um, mothers. Um, in Manitoba, one of the things we're still dealing with, for example, and just building on what Madame uh, LaRoche was speaking about, is birth alerts, particularly for uh, parents who've had histories in child welfare. If there's concerns, their file is immediately uh, opened even prior to, to things. And so we still have kids being appre apprehended from hospitals without even allowing the parent a chance to be able to parent. I'm wondering if you can uh, speak on this a little bit and how uh, we know, like research is very clear, that women who have their children apprehended, uh, they, there's a, a drastic decline in mental health and it becomes harder and harder to parent, right? Be, you know, in terms of consequences of mental health whether it be addiction or trauma or... I'm, I'm, I'm also going to invite Lisa to just pitch in if, if there's anything additional that she might want to add. I, I, I will say that my knowledge of child apprehensions is a little bit limited to my own area of research on postpartum harm thoughts, but I think one of the things that we have underappreciated is the attachment trauma that happens when a mother is separated from her infant. And I think we have lived with the assumption, even for children, that simply moving a child from an unhealthy situation to a healthy situation is only a good thing. And when we have a close attachment relationship with somebody, being taken away from that person is traumatic. Traumatic for children and traumatic for parents and will very likely have fallout in terms of mental health difficulties. And I think that the problem we're having in many ways is, I mean, first of all, there's the systemic racism and the, the history of, for indigenous people in Canada, obviously. But, but there's also an issue of threshold and process. So our threshold is set at a level that assumes that removal will not be damaging, it will only be helpful. And consequently, we're setting the bar in the wrong location. So, so I have a, a question about that because we know that zero to two are the most critical years to develop uh, attachment uh, to another person. Is there a connection between removal of children and potential attachment disorders that develop later on in life? I wish, I wish I knew the answer to that. If you were asking me to guess, I would guess yes. But I, don't, guess? I can't speak f with authority on that. I would, say the, I would say the same thing. I don't, I, don't, I don't know, but my guess would be I mean, the same. I don't know how many people in this room have children, but if you remember your child at the age of a year or a year and a half, it's going to bring tears to my eyes. I think we will all remember the love and the intensity of that relationship, and I think it would be very hard to imagine that there were not consequences. Um, just, a, just a question about, um, you spoke about, uh, I really appreciate, I didn't mean, I wasn't chuckling at you, but the fact that we always have to measure women's health next to men is just so ridiculous. One, uh, one of the things that I know many universities, uh, polytechniques, are really pushing for is more funding for research uh, in academic uh, institution. How is 
the lack of funding, research funding provided to academic institutions uh, impacting women's health? impacting it enormously. I mean, we have so little of it in the first place. I mean, let's be clear, um, our funding uh, levels have been low and they've been declining, you know, in comparison to G7, G20 across many, many countries. Uh, our research, health research funding is, is going the opposite direction that many other countries are going. So, uh, so we have that against us. And we then also have this extreme lack of attention to women's health factors. I, like I said, it was 6%, over 8,000, this is federally funded grants, um, over 11 years. That's, that's a pretty small uh, part, pot, piece of the pie, but we need a larger pie in general. And, and, and our, just to say, like a lot of our costs for research are funding people, right? Yeah. PhD students, but uh, research assistants in our lab, all of those costs are going up. So it's like less and less and less research we can do with the money we have. And just one final question. Uh, we often talk about violence within domestic uh, relationships. Oh, yes. we, we don't talk about violence against women uh, who fall outside of domestic relationships. Um, and we know that often women will use substances mm -hmm. uh, to deal with uh, the violence they're experiencing mm -hmm. as a way of coping. Mm -hmm. I've been pushing for more low barrier uh, spaces for women. Why is it critical to have low barrier spaces uh, for like 24 seven safe spaces, shelter space uh, for women? Okay, I thought a, a, br a brief oh. answer if you could, brief we're answer. out of time. I just say, uh, I'm gonna speak to what I know. Uh, concussions, we all think about sports injuries, football players, hockey players, that more than a thousand fold more with in, uh, interpartner violence from domestic violence. Yeah. Thank you. Women. Ms. Vecchio, please, for five minutes. It, it's wonderful to be having the opportunity to ask questions. I usually don't get that chance. I have five minutes. I'm going to make it really quick. So I'm going to start over on this end. And Nicole and Lisa, starting with you. I believe one of the ways of breaking the stigma is talking about things like menopause and those. So to everybody, menopause, here we come, or here I am. So um, what should we be warning? What should we be warning my other colleagues here about um, when we talk about the mental health? Uh, we can talk about the mental health and all of those different things and the hormonal changes, but also the lost time. You know, I think of, of being here for the last nine years and thinking, ah, I've seen dips in things. And, and when we're looking at lost wages, uh, when we see menopause, we know that there absolutely is not enough done on this, uh, that women are struggling, and then you just, but you just keep on plugging along because that's what we know what to do. So what are some of your recommendations when it comes to menopause, when it comes to some of those studies that we should be doing if we were to invest into, into money into a later stage of the, of the uh, women's cycle? What would you recommend? Uh, can we have more time? Um, <laughs> I, I mean, we, we know so little. In fact, I, li I was just listening to a podcast. It was, it's called uh, This Podcast Will Kill You. And it's, it's, the title of the podcast episode was Menopause is Whatever You Want It to Be. And I, it made me both angry and happy to listen to it. Part of it was because they started um, talking about all the different symptoms that occur during perimenopause, perimenopause being the two to 10 year period prior to menopause, which is cessation of uh, menstrual cycles. Um, and we just know so little about it, right? So, you know, 3% of research, it's something like, uh, I think it's one, you know, 0.5% of research in terms of female brains during menopause is really, 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 really low. So we don't really have a lot of information. And there are so many different 